so thank you. Okay, let's get into the podcast. All right. Um, tell tell us a little about we're it's a casual, we're having a casual conversation, everyone who's listening or watching. It's morning time for us. We're eating breakfast, we're drinking our coffee and our sodas and things of that nature. But tell everyone a little about yourself, your journey, and what you're currently doing. Yeah, so I'm Dr. Capo, right? I'm um, a veterinarian. I practice part-time in general practice, and I um, then do a little bit of emergency relief because I'm a little crazy. Um, And then the rest of my time is speaking and writing and mentorship consulting. I actually have a new program I'm going to be announcing on the 15th. So two days from now. Um, so I don't know when this airs. Perfect. Okay. I can make it happen. Um, soon. <laughs> huh? I said I can make it happen soon. Yes. But um, so I guess, yeah, I can just announce it. Um, so I'm going to be starting a small group mentoring coaching um, specific for in-clinic mentors. So they'll have a combination of on-demand modules that are go over some mentor training things, as well as um, some one-on-one, well, not one-on-one, it'll be a small group uh, chat-based coaching that'll be available two days a week for the duration of the program, which is going to be either three or six months. So we are, we, the official announcement is is coming soon. So we're uh, I'm excited to roll that out. I've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes on that. Well, congratulations. That sounds really exciting. And I love that model. Um, I'm eager to, you know, hear about how people receive that model. Um, So that's really cool. Lots of, you know, I think it's excellent that people are getting more resources in different facets, like, Mm -hmm. you know, what resonates with them and with these different elements that we're seeing in other industries starting to come over into vet med yeah yeah and I think too like I've done some I was a I will admit I was a little skeptical about like the chat-based coaching um but I've done a couple of programs that way now um and it's nice because the the program I'll be using it is chat-based but it also you can send a voice message you can send a document So it's really robust so that like normally, like right now, a lot of the times when I'm working with my coach through it, I'm in a small group coaching program that way. Um, We can just, you know, pop on, throw a voice memo in. Hey, this is what I'm dealing with today. These are the questions I have. And then the coach can, you know, come on when she's available that day and and respond in a, in a voice message. Um, So just, it's a cool way to do it. And it, it, for someone like me who has eight balls in the air at all times, um, it allows me to offer that coaching and support that I want to do without having to, you know, find time to book in a bunch of calls or things like that. I love that. And I think, you know, people will, there's so many different schedules in Batman that I, I really hope the community gets on board with it. And we see even more of that because that is something even through Get Motivated, that, you know, I sort of, I don't want to say struggle with, but struggle with, you know, it's, it's like hurting cats, right? To get (laughs) everyone in a group setting mastermind program or something where people want to be part of the thing, but you know, you're, again, you're hurting cats. You're trying to manage anywhere from, you know, five to 10 or 20, even two, just getting two people in the room at the same time. Yeah. kind of wild people have so many different obligations well I Uh, think you and I have been talking about doing this for like two months like it took us that long to get our schedules together exactly exactly so I love that that's really really cool um and that's gonna be around mentorship right Mm -hmm. yep so that's gonna be specific for support for in-clinic mentors when I like I've been mentoring for years and I love it. And it's, you know, it's just, it's brought me such joy. And when I looked, you know, at the landscape of mentorship, as I was starting to do more of the freelancing and things like that, you know, I saw, you know, there's great programs now for mentee support. You've got MentorVet, Ready, Vet, Go, Possibilities. There's the new Chirp coming out. 
Um, there, there's all kinds of support for the mentees, but there seemed to be a little bit of a black hole of like, who's supporting the people doing the mentoring? And, and while some people it comes, you know, naturally to others, I think can be really good mentors if they have a little bit of support. Um, yeah. And so that's the gap I'm trying to fill. That's a really good um, distinction because even talking about it, I was thinking like, you know, where does this fit in? Mm -hmm. So that's really good. And um, I agree with you that there are natural born sort of mentors for leaders, but without coaching or development in that to hone those skills, they don't know the right questions to ask, the right technique to use, or even, you know, recognizing different personality styles mm -hmm. and what would work well for them versus what would work well for someone else. Like, you know, you and I maybe mentoring the same person, it would look different, right? Yeah. Um, and so to have a little flexibility in that so that people can create their own style through your support. So that's fantastic. Um, and when we talk about mentors, and we're talking about this program. It's for DBMs, right? Is yes. There yeah. Okay. So I am a huge supporter and believer that the whole team, it can be mentors and, and also need mentorship. Um, like I, I really, my very first lecture on mentorship was a team approach to mentorship for new grads. Like that was the first lecture I ever did on mentorship. Um, and I, you know, and so I want, I would love to incorporate technicians into the program um, and other team members. And I, I have my veterinary mentorship manual that kind of provides a blueprint for practices on mentoring new vets. I would love to make a version for technicians, but I'm also only one person. <laughs> and so I'm trying to roll things out gradually. Um, but yes, I do. I, I have the hope that I will be able to incorporate technicians um, down the road um, as, as I discover ways to make more time in my day. <laughs> well, and hopefully what you're doing is we'll have a ripple effect, mm -hmm. you know, just through what that person is learning and how, because one would think, I mean, we're talking about DVMs, they're smart individuals, they're capable, they're very, you know, they're sort of high performers, but they can extract knowledge, extrapolate it. And so mm -hmm. if you're teaching them to do this thing, we all know, even if you don't have a formal role of leadership as an associate veterinarian, oftentimes the team is looking to you for leadership during a shift um, to make decisions or to direct traffic or whatever the thing is, especially if there is a clinic where there aren't systems set up to have departmental leadership or even that, you know, like a, a lead CSR, a lead technician, something like that. If not every clinic ha has that. You have a lot of clinics where it's just, you know, the practice manager and the owner, and then you have your team. But yeah. on that day where, you know, shit is hitting the fan, <laughs> they're going to look to the associate veterinarian. And so if they have yeah. that skill set, they're just going to apply it to say, to, you know, their technician or to their receptionist or to um, the kennel assistant or technician assistant, whatever we're, you know, we're calling our pet care associates these days of this is what we need to do. This is how I coach and develop you. And I, I bring the best out in you. And I think that's wonderful because when we begin even the conversation around investing in our people, it will automatically let them feel that connection. And even if they can't put their finger on it until later in their career and they go, oh my gosh, that, you know, that associate veterinarian or that veterinarian, just, um, they taught me so much. They gave yeah. me the opportunity to learn that, you know, they, they boosted me in a way that yes, was great for my career, but really it's about, are we investing in each other as humans? Are mm -hmm. we developing each other as humans? And so I, I I'm hopeful that that will shine through. And as long as people are open to that and curious about that, 
um, even if they're a part of the program and the, you know, there's a technician on the team and they're like, oh, you know, that's great for you, but what about me? Like, let that kind of go. You know, hopefully there's more of a, that's really great. I wonder how it can help everyone. Like they take yeah. advantage of it versus just like turn it off and say, well, you know, you have support, but I don't. No, right. you've got support because I'm here and I'm doing this thing and it will ripple out. That was a yeah. lot. Yeah. And too, I mean, some of the biggest like influences on who I am as a doctor now did not have DVM after their name or VMD. Um, they, you know, they were the technicians, the receptionists, the, you know, the team members who, you know, held my hand and supported me through those difficult cases or just said, Hey, you can do this. Like, and so, you know, I think that's important too, is to remember, you know, they don't just benefit from mentorship, but they can be mentors too. Yeah. Tell me about how you think well-being and mentorship intersect. I know you have some content on your website around this. You speak a little bit on this topic. It's threaded throughout your work. You know, of course, <laughs> it's getting motivated. We're going to hit on the well-being topic. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Tell me about what's been showing up lately. Let's say in the past year. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, a kind of a couple of intersections uh, for me, like, as I, you know, when I started doing my freelance writing and speaking a few years ago, you know, I kind of had a very like wide net of, of topics and I've, I've, I still speak on a, a wide range of things and write about a wide range of things, but I'm, you know, I'm trying to hone in on, um, you know, mentorship and then my very closely related other passion is spectrum of care. Um, and I think that those two do intersect with well-being. Absolutely. I mean, we know that our early career veterinarians, we've got lots of data across multiple studies that this is our highest risk group in the veterinary population. We know like burnout is higher, psychological distress is higher, um, you know, well-being is lower. And so one of the key things we can do is providing that support and that mentorship framework because mentorship, it's so much more than just training you how to do a spay. Or, you know, it's training you how to talk to clients. It's how to be, you know, how to be a whole doctor, um, set those boundaries. Um, and so, you know, I think I had a post recently that was, you know, you know, said like, if you're not talking about mental health as a mentor, you're not, you're missing a huge piece of mentorship. I love that so much. Um, when you say a whole doctor that hits home because I think for a long time just in our society that was missed um mm -hmm. and I'm happy to see that it's that men that mentality is coming back in a lot of different ways right when we think about medicine or when we think about the workplace that we're approaching each other as whole beings and really approaching ourselves as that giving ourselves permission to be a whole person to be mm -hmm. a doctor and to recognize that it's not just about one thing, whatever that one lane is for us. So thank you for that. I mean, um, what are some of the like bad recommendations that you hear about when you talk to people about mentorship or some of maybe the mistakes or pitfalls that people are making and, you know, maybe it's like unconsciously, right? They had the best of intentions, but it really mm -hmm. went south. Does anything like yeah. that for you when you're working with people one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the biggest things I see, like just looking at the landscape of the profession is not setting expectations. So you, everybody's job ad says, you know, we offer mentorship, you know, new grads welcome. You know, and I tell new grads, okay, that's great, but you need, you have to ask what that means because the mindset of some people is, you know, mentorship is I'm going to be, you know, I'm here. I can answer a few questions if you have it, but they don't realize that, you know, like you said, they have the good intention, but they don't realize how much effort it is going to take and how much time to support that new grad's development. 
Um, so I think that's definitely one of the biggest pitfalls I see um, for practices is, you know, uh, like saying like, okay, you know, we're desperate for an associate. We're going to be open to bringing on a new grad. Um, and okay, we know they need mentorship. So yeah, we'll say we'll provide that. Um, you know, and, and certainly there are some new grad veterinarians that will do just fine in that kind of a situation. Um, you know, and, and so that's why it's so important to have the conversation during the job interview of, you know, what does the practice think mentorship looks like and what does the new grad think mentorship looks like? And if we can match those, then we're more likely to have a good outcome because there's some data out there um, that, you know, one of the, you know, one of the top reasons for new grad turnover is lack of mentorship and toxic practice culture. Um, and the, the most recent study I've seen, it was out of New Zealand in 2020. Um, and they looked at new grads in their first five years out and 60% had either left or were strongly considering leaving their first practice, um, in that time period. And the average length they were staying was like 14 months. So you invest a lot of time and resources into mentorship and they leave after a year or sometimes less, a lot of the time it's because what you thought you were providing as mentorship wasn't what they needed. Yeah. And by not addressing that toxic culture, like those two mm -hmm. really big prongs to it, um, they are and, practice. Lots yeah, and not checking on their mental health. That was specifically stated as, I think it was, I think it increased the odds of, of people leaving by like five if if their if their colleagues were not checking on their physical and mental well-being. Yeah. Because again, right, are we investing in each other as as humans? That's and that's what leadership is again when you're not even in a formal role. But are you looking to the person to the left of you and to the right of you and saying, I get I care, you know, I I I, I give it to <laughs> what did it curse again? Um, because I genuinely, I, you know, I care about you. I, I enjoy you. I want for you to succeed. I want to, I want for you to be a part of what I like to now call shared success, which is, you know, whether it's patient outcomes, team outcomes, um, it's just this, this idea around shared success. So thank you for sharing that. I know there's so much data around it now. And I hope that this podcast and the resources that you and me and all of the company, like some of the companies that you mentioned and um, that that is getting back to the clinics. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, a, another part of that is people having resources like yours or ours or something where they don't have to do it all themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's something I noticed throughout my 20 years is when you are working in certain clinics and they have the mentality of, you know, we're not going to refer our patients out. We're not going to bring on other products or programs or services or people. Like it's just, it's just us. We are going to do it all. But that oftentimes, you know, can fail or they have that, like we tried that once and it didn't work. You know, it didn't work with this one thing that we tried. Um, so I encourage people just to like, keep trying, try different methods, try different, figure out like what feels good, what matches for your company, your culture, um, in the updated, in the updated version, right? Even if you've owned a practice for 10 years or 20 or a hundred years, you know, I talked to a practice owner, um, the clinic, she hadn't owned it for a hundred years, but it was a hundred year clinic. Wow. She has this dream of you know, potentially selling that one day and retiring. But her number one desire was that she would be able to turn the practice over with a positive culture. And so that was really her intention in the next, say, three years um, is to turn that culture around so that they didn't have as much turnover. And that's all around DVMs, all the way, every role, right? Um, and so to solve some of these things, we have to stop looking at the symptom and solve the other thing, right? We have to solve that underlying condition. So um, 
that's really cool. And I like that number one question for interviewees to ask and to ask the employer, but also to ask themselves, you mm-hmm. know, around what does it look like for you and for you to define that, um, define what that looks like for you. Even if you are, we'll say in the river, let's say you're, you know, five years out, maybe you're a technician looking for a new opportunity, or you just, you want to stay at your clinic, but something has to give, something has to change. You've got to be able to go to your people, your leadership and say, all right, I am here to renegotiate, whether it's boundaries or renegotiate, like my mentorship, we've got something has to change. And here's what I think it could look like. This is what I think it could feel like. Um, and that becomes the, the metric to say, is this working? You know, are my expectations being met um, more often than not, right? It doesn't have to be all of the time, but just more often than not. Um, because people just don't know what to ask. So I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I would say one of the other pitfalls that I see and and that I've experienced personally is um, situations where the, um, like the, uh, if you're bringing a new grad in, there's a lot of things unique to that new grad period um, with, you know, mindset and confidence levels and, and unique needs that they have. And if you bring them into a situation, you can have the best veterinarian mentor, but if the team doesn't understand the fact that they're going to be less efficient, they are going to need to look things up, they are going to ask questions. And it doesn't mean they don't know what they're doing or that they don't have the knowledge. It's usually they don't have the confidence. Um, And that's, you know, and so if the team starts looking at it as, oh, they have no idea what they're doing, you know, you get that, you can get that negative ripple effect of, well, we're not going to schedule these clients with them because we want them to be with the doctor that we trust. Um, and, and it can get into a pretty bad situation. And so that's the other thing is just making sure the team's on board and setting those expectations of, you know, hey, this is, you know, this is normal for a new grad and you're used to working with me who's been out 10 years. Um, and not that I don't ever look things up because I do on a daily basis, but I'm not looking things up for every case necessarily. Um, and I, you know, I have developed efficiency. I can see double booked appointments, you know, things like that. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's the other big pitfall that I see sometimes is, um, you know, where you don't have a team that's on board to provide that support. Yeah. I feel like that is a bit of compassion fatigue because sometimes what you see in clinics is, and we used to call this at like my first clinic, was like, we would say lifers. People who are there and who are nurses or, you know, whatever role you are, and you've been there for 10, 20 years. You know, you even see this sometimes in TV shows, right? You have a a new doctor, a physician, but the nurse is the one who is like reminding them of the next steps or saying, you've got this, like, I don't have this knowledge, you have this knowledge, but you've got this situation, take a breath. Um, again, coaching and somewhat mentoring them to your point earlier, but to do that in a way that is compassionate and that is helping each other be better versus bitter and remembering where you were when you first started and you were a newbie right? You're not a senior veteran employee. You know, you've been in the game long enough, whether, and, and I see that, and that's part of that toxic culture, right? I see that in, in all, all the roles, people just forget how precious their training and their tacit knowledge, everything that you learn on the job, um, supports you and your confidence versus our, our new employees who do not have that knowledge, but just like our pet parents, you don't look at them and treat them with condescension for mm-hmm. not knowing what you know. They are not supposed to know what you know. They're not five years in or 10 years in or even three years in, right? They're three days in. 
Um, and so to wrap a little compassion and just remember like where you were at back then or where you would be at if you were to jump into another industry, you know, and get a job and have a new computer system and be answering these questions and dealing with these people, um, you know, that you've never dealt with, even different clientele. It's all the same medicine, but you move somewhere else and the people are different. It's, a, you know, there's different, um, it's just different. And so to, to just wrap a little compassion around that. And, and if, and if you are that person, if you are that team member, who's like, oh, wow, I kind of, I recognize this in myself. I'm treating my team members, um, poorly. If you have that level of self-awareness, um, or emotional intelligence, this is the wake up call to go oh, am I a little bit bitter? Do I think that people should know things that they don't know? Um, and that's it. Just have the awareness around it and take a pause, you know, before the next time you interact with them or the next time that you are near them while they are interacting with a pet or a pet parent um, or even a team member. And say, okay, how can I help them in this situation learn so that they can grow into, say, me, right? Like into a veteran employee, like whoever you are, like me being whoever that employee is. Um, that's really, that's a really big one, really big one. And I think it's, I'm sure it's in, I'd probably say, heck, 90% of the clinics at some point, you know, at some point. You've got at least one employee who has drifted in and maybe out um, because of that sort of treatment and and how they work. So wh um, what are some simple things that practices or people can do to um, like one or two really simple things? Is it, you know, is it, do you have favorite books that you would recommend they read? Is it some of your articles? Um, like just what are some simple things that people want to say, okay, let's shift, let's, you know, just try one thing for our practice mm -hmm. to try to avoid some of these pitfalls or whatever else and, and bring in mentorship or just that, um, sort of, um, like an element of it into the atmosphere. Let's, let's t start talking about it as a team. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one thing when it comes to new grads, I would say, take the time to set up a mentorship agreement. Um, it, you know, I've seen some people now that'll put like a clause in their contract, um, that says, you know, we'll provide mentorship for X amount of time. And maybe there's some stipulations around a reduced salary or something like that during that time. Um, you know, and, and I think that's, that's a great first step, but like for me, an agreement is, okay, who's responsible for what, how often are we meeting? What does our schedule look like? Um, and just kind of having a little more definition of, of roles and responsibilities. Um, and I think that practices can kind of create a template of what that looks like, but I really want the mentor and mentee to develop that final document together. Um, you know, so I think that's one thing that's really important is just, you know, setting those, like I said, setting those expectations. Um, and then just from the whole team perspective, you know, I think it is just, you know, shifting that mindset a little bit, like you said, of, of just remembering, you know, this is not someone who has years and years of experience. And our new grads who are coming out now, who've come out in the past couple of years, their education was significantly impacted by COVID. And so, you know, I'm talking to mentors now who are like, there's this huge, like, gap in their knowledge that, you know, I've never seen, you know, I've mentored for years. I've never seen this before. And I'm like, okay, but think about, you know, our new grads of class of 2024 started school in 2020. So let's think about what that education looked like for them. Um, and so I, I think it is just about, you know, even just asking, you know, hey, you know, can I, if you're a technician and you see your new colleague doing something and, you know, you say, okay, maybe I've got a different way to, to do this that's more efficient, or I've seen other doctors do something like this, you know, make a respectful suggestion to say, hey, can I, you know, offer a piece of advice based on my observations? 
Um, I used to have a doctor that I worked with. Um, he was um, part time at the practice I was at, um, and you know he was close to retirement. And he used to always come up and he'd go, "I'd like to submit something for your consideration." And I just loved that. I love the way he said that because it was very much like, "This is my suggestion. You don't have to take it, but I'm like, I'm not going to be offended. Just something to think about." Um, and then just giving all that po giving that positive feedback, celebrating when things are going well, when the mentee does their first, you know, spay all by themselves with no one scrubbing in with them, or, you know, handles a really challenging client communication, you know, just making sure that we're, we're really celebrating all of those positives. I think that's so cute. Um, and I like that, you know, when you talked about communication for the team or for the, you know, associate veterinarians to new grads is before giving that suggestion, asking their permission. Mm -hmm. um, it's in really good presenters, speakers, or even salespeople, um, if they're really good and not like sleazy, they ask your permission to share something like, may I tell you a story or can I share this thing with you? You know, not that there's oftentimes an audience who's like, no, thank you, you know, but they do it because it's, it's a, it's a neurological thing to, to, to hack in a way, because we're asking that permission to, to enter. And that is a boundary, right? That's one of those invisible boundaries that if people are just lobbying things at you and you didn't ask for that, and you didn't know that it was coming and you're not in a state to receive that it not only will it fall but it potentially could do damage and so to to sort of prime yourself in a way to to get into that state of receiving and maybe you're not in that receiving mode in that moment right maybe you did just deal with a difficult client and you don't you don't have the capacity to get more data input and then be able to download it in a way that makes your software run better. You have to say, let me wait until tomorrow, let this diffuse first, and then we'll debrief and unpack and, and talk about better ways um, because you're just not in a state to, to really make a good change. So I like that, um, you know, the, the offer there. So um when you're feeling overwhelmed in in life, right? So maybe not in practice, maybe in practice, but just you as Kate and all of the roles that you have, all of the hats that you have on, um, mama, DVM, entrepreneur, like, and all the things that come with that, right? Um, when you're feeling overwhelmed or uh, oh, unfocused, what are some things that you do to right the ship? What are some questions that you ask yourself? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a great question. And I certainly like, sometimes I feel like I live in the place of overwhelm. Um, like, you know, I think there's that I'm, I'm one of those people where like, if I don't have 10 things going on at once, I'm like, what's going on? Like, why am I not busy? Um, and I'm, I'm working on that. <laughs> um, but so I'm a big reader. So I'll sometimes, you know, I'll either read or I do a lot of audiobooks um, because I can do those during my commute or things like that. Um, I, I like running. I'm an, I would say I'm an off and on runner. Like when I have a race to train for, I'm really good at, at keeping up with it. But when I have nothing to, when I don't have that goal to train for, um, like I ran a half marathon in November and I don't think I've run since. Um, and we're like four months later and I keep saying like, I need to get back to that. I really enjoy it. Um, but, but that, um, and you know, I also like, I play mindless games on my phone, um, just as a like way to just, you know, just to unplug my brain for a few minutes. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's usually like just trying to, Pull my brain to focus on something else. Um, and yeah. so either that, you know, the physical activity or something mentally stimulating with like a book or something like that. Yeah. And it's, it's funny, right? Like stimulating to distract or non-stimulating to, to power down. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, you know, and that comes from that awareness comes from like, what do I need? Right. Like mm -hmm. you have 
know yourself well enough to go, what do I need in this moment? Um, and it, I do the same thing um, in, in some respects. What kind of, what books are you reading right now or listening to? Like author yeah. books? Yeah, so I am, currently I'm listening to, it's called First Lie Wins. It's a thriller. Um, I've been... I've been kind of on a like a fantasy genre kick. Um, so I, I've done like I just did the Throne of Glass series um, and a couple other of like big sprawling series. And um, I started another series and I just couldn't get into it. Um, and I very rarely don't finish a book. But like I was like three hours into the audio and the plot hadn't moved at all. And I was just annoyed by the characters. Um, and I talked to some of the fellow mom book club people. And they're like, yeah, I felt the same way. Like, it's it's okay if you just put it down and move on. Um, so I, I enjoy thrillers just because they're fast paced and I like trying to figure out the twists and turns. So, um, so that's what I'm listening to now. I'll have to get a list from you. Of... <laughs> I have a long one. <laughs> like, what's that? I have a long one. Um, I, I like mysteries. Um, I like, there's different types. Mo most of the content that I read is nonfiction, mm -hmm. but I keep that fiction sometimes in order to do the brain thing, um, because I've got too much going on here. And so I need to somewhat escape a little bit. Right. Um, and oftentimes it's for like movies and stuff kind of, but I, t I love, I love tangible books, especially mm -hmm. during the summer. And so summer reads, I like sort of lighter reads, but um, this, this winter and fall, I really found myself getting into some mysteries, shows and things like that. And so I would like some books that are in that same regard where I can, I just don't know what's going on. Like I know what's going on, but I don't know what's going right. on. You should. So one of my favorite mystery series is the Thursday Murder Club. Okay. Um arc but mm -hmm. I don't like it to be too dark it's and not it's okay. not it it does take so it's about four um people who live in a retirement community they're in like their 70s and 80s and they like to insert themselves in some of the local police investigations <laughs> um and it, they're fun, like yes there is some sad stuff it takes place in a retirement community okay <laughs> like there is some sad stuff okay. um too. I like funny. Do you have any right. funny? And, but yeah, the characters are funny and just the situations, like there's like four books in the series right now, but I highly recommend. Uh, you know, I think it's, I love that there are more shows around seniors. And um, <laughs> since I like it was in my late thirties, I, <clears throat> I began looking at the shows going, why are the, there are more shows about friends and like couples and stuff in their mid life or mm -hmm. later um we've got a few out there now that are like seniors but there's still not a lot of shows around like 40s like life yeah. at 40. um and i want that so <laughs> in the event that there's some producer out here um netflix or whatever like give me more 40 year old shows that are potentially <laughs> uh preferably really sitcoms um to make life at 40 seem more comical uh, because a lot of those shows you see like 20s and 30s, mm -hmm. you know, like kind of just figuring out their lives before they settle, we'll say settle down and have families and stuff. Um, and there's been some that have done it well, like Life in Pieces is a really great show that has three different generations. You've got the kids, the parents, and then the, the grandparents. Really great show. I would love to see more shows like that where we've got the just the generations. But um, have you ever watched Grace and Frankie? I haven't hilarious it's 70s right. 80s um on netflix it's a hilarious show but I, they're they're oldies um and they just get into all sorts of antics as they navigate um a life-changing thing that happens to them in the pilot episode so um okay cool i love it <laughs> i'm gonna look at those books and those authors um what new belief behavior or habit in say the last five years has improved your life so it's got to be like a new thing I would say I mean so like the last five years is kind of 
where I've done this transition from full-time clinical practice into the the part-time practice and and working on the um you know the speaking and the writing and the consulting um hmm. I think one of the things and I'm not always great at doing it but when I do it I I find I'm I'm definitely better at it is um like I'll keep I'll do I'll make a calendar I have a calendar and I'm a I'm a handwritten person like yes I have a calendar on my phone like I couldn't live without it but like I like having something where I can look at my week and I'll set out like hey here are here's like the upcoming deadlines I have here are the things I want to accomplish this week and try to spread them out through the week um so that I kind of know okay if I only accomplish one thing on Monday I need it to be that I paid my bills or if, you know, Tuesday, I need it to be that I got that article done. Um, so it just kind of helps me like doing that mental plan ahead of time. Um, I don't always stick to it. I try to, you know, I schedule workouts in there and then they don't happen um, and, and things like that. But I think for me, just taking that time to kind of sit down at the beginning of the week and, and make a plan for, you know, kind of what my goals are. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. And I add, I, I add like reflection that do you, I would assume when you're looking at your week to week, you're kind of saying you're looking at that last week and going, mm -hmm. I accomplished what needs to be rolled over, whatever the thing is. Um, but that mental preparation, um, I, I do that. And when I don't do it, uh, I'll find like I was late to a meeting just last week because I, it's funny, I sat down and I had my weekly, um, I have lots of different calendars and same as you, digital and paper. Um, and I went to do the weekly, but then I said, no, I have to do something else. And I needed to do something else on the computer. And so I didn't do that weekly assessment. And then at like 9.15, I don't know what drew me over to the calendar, but I looked at Google <laughs> Calendar and I was late for a meeting. Um, or it might have been a message. Quincy went and texted, who knows, whatever the thing was. And I was like, oh, I'm the meeting. And so I yeah. went and jumped in. Um, but yeah, you find like, I don't, you've got so many, like you said, plates in the air that if you're not, if I'm not looking at my calendar, even throughout the day, um, mm -hmm. like, I don't know what I'm sometimes supposed to be doing. And here's the thing. I really like days where I have nothing, blocks of time where I don't have to be in that mode mm -hmm. because I need that. Um, but at the same time, I need the other. So um, that's really cool. Really cool. Weekly yeah. projection, spreading it out. I think that's a really important element so that it's not all like, I have, like all in one day or whatever the thing is. Like you can just spread it out like that sort of lengthens your bandwidth so and, and usually at the usually the last week of the month is the month where it's like oh I have these six articles due that I knew about all month and I didn't work on and now I've got to scramble <laughs> um but but yeah I mean and I think sometimes too it's also just being able to like when I have a week where hey things didn't go as planned like my kid got sick um you know something like that it's giving being able to give yourself a little bit of a grace when you didn't accomplish all of the things you intended to for the week. Yeah, that's a really great point, especially since we're in right now when we're recording, we're in March and like baby G, he's been ill the entire month of February to some degree, you know, like not. Mm -hmm. Yep, Connor too. Yep. But like, it's, it's just the winter ick that is <laughs> sticking with them. Even my eldest, he had two different um diagnosable conditions uh my youngest he was like negative on everything but Brayden had gotten um he had gotten the flu and he was like back to back um and so it was just a mess of like trying to quarantine him because I was like I am not I'm not getting this I have speaking engagements coming up um uh and I didn't want my youngest to get it and I was like it was and, you know I was back in 2020 I'm like, like, life's a good thing. And Neil's like, Renee, it's fine. Um, I'm over here with like latex gloves and N95. And <laughs> like, he feels like a leper. You know? yeah. like, I'm sorry, buddy. But like, you know, mom's got. 
I gave, I had six hours of lecture in February at the Ohio VMA conference at Midwest Vet Conference. Um, and I was fighting a cold like the whole time. And like, I literally just loaded my bag up with like tea and honey. And like, I was, I was afraid I was going to lose my voice halfway through the day. And, you know, and I made it through, but yeah, yeah. it's just, yeah, that extra, like, I really need my voice for the work I do. <laughs> there was a fetch conference that I had went to, and I can't even tell you which one it was. Um, but I, at like, I didn't sleep by 4 a.m. I had the highest fever. Um, don't worry, I don't believe I infected anyone. But I mean, I had, it was the most wild I had ever felt, um, especially while traveling. And I just rallied. Um, and what's funny about this story is we go into the room, you know, I'm, I'm not interacting with people, but I'm just speaking. And, um, I, I'm, I'm giving the lecture, right? I think it's maybe one, two hours or something like that. And I have sweat dripping down my back. I'm in a dress. I'm just pouring sweat. And at the end of it, I said to Quincy, I'm like, I'm going to faint. <laughs> you might have to carry me back to the room or something. And he goes, why? What's going on? I'm like, I'm roasting. He goes, oh, well, I had the people turn up the heat in this room. And I could have wrung his neck. I was like, you know that I am dying over here. And finding a fever and you had them turn up the heat. I was like, no, I would have been totally fine. You know, like when you're sweating profusely, it really drains your focus. Like, yeah. ah. I, no. I think that might have been the fetch conference we met. Because I remember you being sick. I remember you saying, like, you're going to have to email me because I can't talk right now because I'm sick. <laughs> oh, oh that's so funny I like it though give yourself grace give yourself <laughs> grace. yes that's like the if you could leave people with one thing I feel like giving yourself grace could be that thing oh yeah definitely yeah oh my goodness well thank you so much for your time today I won't keep you I know you're totally busy and we'll keep yelling and talking and hopefully we'll link up again um I know I think either one of us don't have a ton of things on our calendar for this year um deliberately that is but um I'm sure we'll link up again maybe yes. a marathon or something Where, what state are you in again I'm in Pennsylvania I'm in Pennsylvania we but can... I only run half marathons in Disney. Oh, you only do Disney. <laughs> yes. Yeah. My husband's like, you know, you can run half marathons elsewhere. And I'm like, if I'm running 13 miles, it better be somewhere fun. <laughs> I'm not running 13 miles in Pittsburgh. I'm not... <laughs> I've never even been to Disney. Oh my goodness. <sighs> That's funny. Do you, do you dig Disney? Like, do you do the Disney thing? Yeah, my best friend uh, from high school and I, like we've done, we've done three half marathons down there now um, with the Disney races. And yeah, we just make a, a girls weekend out of it and we do the parks and the races. And I think the last time I had like 60,000 steps one day, um, like my feet, I had, I had blisters. It was bad, <laughs> but, but it was, it's fun. <laughs> All right. I will. I probably won't do that. Maybe you can train <laughs> for like a half, half marathon. Like do like a ten k. Yeah. Do they have five k's? They do have five k's. I do a lot of five k's. It's only three I miles. Lot. Um, I used to run a lot after I got um after I got separated. Well, I was exercising a lot before I was even separated from my ex. But once we had separated, that was like my thing. Um, my chant, like you know, my channel of I just ran. I ran a lot. Um, but then after I said, I have to have, after I had Gavin, um, about six months into being pregnant with Gavin, everything changed for me physically. Um, my yoga practice changed my running, everything changed for me and I've not been able to, and, and that's again, giving yourself that grace. I don't think I'll ever be that 
that version mm-hmm. of, of Renee. And so it's really creating like who I am now and like who I'm going to be. Um, but even that is like difficult to, to cultivate. Um, but it's something that I'm not giving up on. Um, and so that's, I like that idea of having, um, a goal such as that to, to train for and stuff. So awesome. All right, love. Well, I will let you go. Enjoy the rest of your day. Maybe go take a nap if you have. Oh yeah. That's, I don't, I don't schedule anything for the last like hour or two on these days, uh, when my nanny's here, um, and I have my writing days so that I have the option and I almost always take a nap. Um, so nap with him. Uh, I do when I'm home with him. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I know I have so many pictures one day I'm going to have, um, I'll put them all together, but like I take pictures of G sleeping and it's so meaningful to me to have been able to spend this time with him and, um, you know, him being able to nap at home and and still have that nap practice. Like a lot of people, and it's, it's hit or miss now he's going to be four in April. Um, so some days he certainly doesn't take a nap, but you know, he still does a lot of, you know, I'd say three, three or four days out of the week, he's, he's napping. Um, and I love that. I think that's fantastic for development, but also just the freedom of, you know, humans, like, that's what we want to do. Like if that's what our body wants to do versus, you know, being in a structured way where he doesn't get to nap or um, if he is in a, a different setting where naps are scheduled or something, um, you know, so I love to be able to, for him to nap, but then it's so cool if I can nap at the same time. Sometimes mm-hmm. we actually nap in like opposites. <laughs> like I'll get really tired and he's, you know, uh, like rodeoing around the living room. And I'll just <laughs> conk out. It's rare. It's rare. But I will, I'll fall asleep. And then, you know, when I, I'll wake up and then he gets tired. But it's cool because, like, you know, he's so, he's so good. Um, and he's always had freedom in the living room. Like, he was never a penned child. Like, I don't mm-hmm. dogs. I don't kennel my kids. And so he's all, but he just, he does his thing. You know, he does his thing. Um and as long as he has provisions, right? He has the provision mm-hmm. to be able to eat and drink and not like, mom, I need this. And mom, I need this. He, he has his, thing, his things that he needs. And then I wake up and he naps. And then I kind of have this quiet time, um, you know, because he's <laughs> doing whatever I need to do. So sometimes yeah. that's it. But I love snuggling with him. I, love- I know. Yeah. On my days off, Connor's like, mom, will you nap with me today? And I'm like, yes, I will happily nap with you today. Oh, yes I love it and it's it's so like they just they get snuggly mm-hmm. um, sometimes like he napped the other day I was out of town and my guy woke up or he was he's with my guy and then he napped in the car and then when he he took him to, to the shop and so when he woke up he was in the snuggly vibe but like my guy was doing his job and so he was I had called him at that moment and I could tell it was, it just, it went so south because he's like, I want you to do like I need you. And it was, it was heart wrenching, but, um, he, you know, they like to snuggle when they wake up and I love that. Like I'll, we'll go out in the hammock, you know, and lay mm-hmm. side and just watch the birds and the clouds and, um, just kind of wake up um, out there. So very cool. Okay. I will officially let you go. I love <laughs> right. about the fun things, about all the things, um, and letting, you know, our listeners. Ah. How, and when is, he turned four, right? He turned He's four. four and a half. Yeah. 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 It's a cool age, right? It is. It is. Yeah. He like, he, it's like that bridge of like, I want to be really independent, but I do still need your help for a lot of things. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, Go enjoy it. I'll let you go. All All right. Have a good day.